my name is Danny Deliberto. Um, I'm the founder of Ladles of Love. Um, it was founded in 2014. I was on a breathing and meditation course through the art of living. And um, during the course, we were uh, being taught a Sanskrit word, and the word was seva, uh, S-E-V-A, meaning giving of yourself, wanting nothing in return. And that really resonated with me while listening to this uh, DVD. And our seva for that day was to go out and serve homeless people a cup of tea. So I arranged with the teacher that I could prepare a pot of soup through the restaurant, as I wasn't far, we weren't doing the course far from the restaurant. And um, we went out and served, uh, we came to the restaurant, dished up the soup into little cups, takeaway cups, and we went out serving the homeless people. And it just literally clicked. Um, I feel with, with people wanting to do good, um, we become overwhelmed, we're not sure what to do or how to approach it. And that was one of my problems. I've always been the type of person that wants to help and give back, and, but never really knew how to. And, and by doing this, it just literally all clicked into place. And having the restaurant, it was just really easy uh, to just start. And so in July 2014, um, I think it was the 15th of July, we served our first soup kitchen on a chilly Tuesday evening. It was quite wonderful, arranged with volunteers. Uh, in the building here, uh, there was bicycles that the guests could rent. So I went to the GM of the hotel and asked if we could borrow the bicycles. And we sent, we had about six bikes, so we sent out the guys to go and look for homeless people and tell them that we were starting to serve a soup kitchen. And uh, our first soup kitchen, I think we served about 70 meals, if I recall. I, I remember the second Tuesday, the meals dropped, and I thought, okay, this is obviously not working. And, but funny enough, after that, it just started growing. And um, what grew from 70 meals, we now serving over 2,000 meals a week. Um, um, we've got three soup kitchens going around the city, uh, various parts of the city. And, um, and then it was about two or three years ago. Um, no, it was actually after my first year. With, um, we had been going for about a year. Um, our soup kitchen was getting really big. We were hitting about 200 meals a week, etc. And um, it was becoming, I wanted to do more. And um, I started like wanting to try and create a space for the guys to wash or clean or do something. And, and I was getting a little bit confused and overwhelmed again. And I remember speaking to a friend of mine, and he said to me, Danny, just do what you know best. and You know how to feed people, and just do that. <laughs> and the minute I, I dropped my focus just on that, uh, it just started to, to grow even more. And um, our second soup kitchen um, started at the carpenter shop um, uh, by, uh, by chance. Um, I was helping a crowd of homeless people that were on a rehab Course. And part of their course was to prepare a meal for homeless people every Saturday. They were coming to me for, for, um, for food and stuff. And I don't know what happened at the carpentry shop, but their support system pretty much fell through. And here were these um, hundred or so homeless people that were coming every Saturday for a soup kitchen. So I thought I could take that over. And so that was our second soup kitchen. And then our third soup kitchen, I started in Seapoint. I felt we needed to move out where other guys were and um, try and get those guys on that side. Anyway, Seapoint, the guys were a little bit apprehensive about me starting a soup kitchen there, and I got a lot of flack. But after some negotiation, um, we agreed that, uh, and working with the Haven Shelter in Greenpoint, that they had a space there that I could start serving a soup kitchen. And so that was the third soup kitchen that started. And then around about three years ago, the same friend of mine um, um, he was telling me how he's, he's got a program at schools called One Million Strong, encouraging kids, you know, teaching kids about making the right choice, etc. And he was telling me how there are kids that go to school hungry and they don't get food at school and, and it's really difficult for them to concentrate and that again was another very strong touching point for me and um, it was it, then I realized that that was Ladle's next step and so we started serving schools and um, we're now in three schools that we serve in um, 
the one school we serve um, once a week will take the hot soup there and they'll put it into their pots and they'll dish up the kids. And then the other two schools um, sort of work together where I drop food, um, uncooked food, so all the ingredients that they need to prepare food for the kids Monday to Friday. So instead of just waiting for me once a week to arrive with a pot of soup, they now prepare this food for the kids. So we're on two schools there. And, um, and then we've connected with other organizations such as U-Turn. Uh, once a week they come and collect ingredients from us, um, 40 or 50 kilos or so, and that, that helps towards their, their soup kitchen um, every Monday to Friday. Um, we work with another organization, Care Cruises. Uh, every two weeks they prepare sandwiches and they pack it in these beautiful little bags and they make it pretty and they put in pretty little notes and they serve it with a fruit. So I help them with the fruit and the bread and the, the ham and the cheese and the mayonnaise so they can make these sandwiches. And, um, and then I think that's, so in total, as I said, that's about 2,000 meals that we're preparing weekly. Um, we've been doing Mandela Day ever since 2015. That's been a big day for us. Um, uh, and what I've noticed with Mandela Day is um, that it's, it's a great day. It's wonderful how you see people just open up their hearts and want to be part. It's, it's their time to, to give back. It's a day our focus is to give back. So people just open up their hearts. And it's amazing the donations that come in and the people wanting to do the 67 minutes, etc. Um, but what was I'm, I was finding quite sad was how the next day just disappeared. It literally went from up here to zero. And it became like a question of what happens after Mandela Day? You know, why can't we make Mandela Day every day? You know, Mandela Day every day. So we kept doing Mandela Days and the same story. And this year I decided I wanted, we get a lot of requests for 67 minutes. So I wanted to create an event that could create a lot of 67 minutes where people can come and give over their 67 minutes. And at the same time, create an event where we can take it to Mandela Day and beyond. So the focus is Mandela Day and beyond this year. So our goal is to raise 250,000 Rand. And with that money, we want to fund another school for a year till Mandela Day 2020 with a feeding program. So we're going to find a school that needs assistance with food and we will provide them a meal every day till Mandela Day 2020. Um, so I've created this huge event that we're going to do on Pier Place, just off here in Krucht Street. And we're going to set up a huge tent, 30 by 10 tent, and we're just going to have a cook-off the entire day. We, um, you come in, you cut your veg, uh, you cook the veg. We're going to do a street store, where, where, like a pop-up clothing store for the homeless. Obviously, they don't pay. They'll just come and choose their clothes. It'll be a very dignified, um, disciplined approach towards a clothes drive. I've had many bad experience with closed drives uh, and homeless people. So um, that in itself has been a very expensive, it's, it's, to set that up has been an expensive exercise. So part of that and wanting to raise a 250,000 Rand is we asking people to go online with Quicket, book your slot for 100 bucks. That 100 bucks goes towards the 250,000, towards the setup of the, of the event and hopefully we can reach our goal of 250,000 Rand. So, so um, let's, we, we're holding thumbs, we launched last week and um, we're getting some really wonderful response from corporates. Um, people donate, I mean, we've already had almost a ton of vegetable donated to us, which is amazing. Um, I've just got email that we're gonna get non-perishables like our lentils, beans, stuff like that donated. Um, you know, the hiring places are giving it to us at 50%. Uh, we've got chairs and tables donated to us for the day. Uh, banks have donated knives and potato peelers, like hundreds of them, for us to use. Because we're literally going to create prep stations with a cutting board and a chopping knife and a peeler. And you come and you, you just cut that veg. I've got a ton of veg that I need to cut and cook. So we're going to obviously provide that to all the homeless people uh, as their meal for the day. And then we're also going to ask organizations to come and collect food that they need, freshly prepared soup. They can come and take, we'll have it in 25 litre buckets. They can take as many buckets as they want. 
to feed their, their, their organization. So we're hoping, I mean, our, we're looking at going for 2,000 liters of soup. Uh, that's not a lot, but, uh, so I'm hoping more, but at least 2,000 liters of soup that we want to prepare. So, so that will be our Mandela Day initiative. We try and encourage people to give up their 67 minutes, but to go beyond the 67 minutes. So pay 100 rand and help feed a child. Help us feed a child for a year, you know. So, so that's what I think, I think this about coming to give your 67 minutes, it's wonderful, but we need to go beyond now. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of poverty out there. There's a lot of people in need. And, and I think we need to go beyond. And people, as I said, we don't know what to do. So we, you know, part of, part of what's happened with ladles is we try and make it easy for people to give up their time. Um, uh, I mean, our soup kitchens, we are inundated with volunteers that come and, and want to be part of it and serve. You know, so, uh, and that's what's been wonderful about ladles of love. Um, you know, that Sanskrit word seva, when you... When you become a, I like to call it a sever warrior, as in not a person who worries, but as in a warrior. So when you become a sever warrior, and you and you and you and you perform the art of sever, um, giving because you can, giving because it's the right thing to do, wanting absolutely nothing in return, what happens is that is not negotiable. That life does give you back in return, and I'm not talking about a bank full of money. I'm talking about um, volunteers coming together, for example. So, so we don't only feed homeless people. You come to a soup kitchen and you watch strangers come together and just with one purpose, to serve the homeless people. And that in itself, you watch this and, and the gratitude. And it all happened organically. I didn't plan this. I didn't know. It's, it's almost like I'm not a, a religious man. I'd like to say I'm a more spiritual person, but I believe we're part of a cosmic chaos, a godly force, whatever you want to call it. And, and it's just wonderful to see God in action, if you want to say. Let me just use those words, words that everyone understands. But I almost feel like I'm a vehicle for ladles of love. Um, um, uh, the, the beautiful thing, I've, I've run business, and I've run ladles of love. And business, you use your head. Ladles of love, I've been using my heart, and, and, and it's wonderful to see how you are so guided by intuition, if you want to call it. So I've always gone with life, this whole journey, I've been provided with the people that I've needed at the time. People have come, people have gone, as I've needed them, they come, when their time is up, they go. It's amazing to watch this, you know, and, and wherever Ladles is, is because I've really had no control over it. I've, I've listened to my gut feel and I've acted on it. If it sticks, I continue with it. If it doesn't stick, I let it go. And that's why we are where we are um, because of that. So, so it's, it's, it's really, it's been an amazing journey, five years of ladles, um, challenging, no doubt, tiring at times, because when you give, 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 you know, you need to find the time to replenish yourself because if you're not strong you can't be you can't be strong for others so but it's still a beautiful journey so it feeds the soul that's why we say feeding the soul because it feeds the souls of the homeless people very strict about serving fresh food tasty food food that you and I would enjoy because they're not homeless they're human beings and there's no need to serve them a, a tasteless pot of food because they're homeless so I'm very strict about that. So, so you, you've seen the guys enjoying their food, thanking you, thank you. Oh, your food's so wonderful on a chilly night. You know, we serve come rain, shine, public holiday. We've served uh, because the guys are hungry, and that's what we do. So, so you're feeding the soul of them. You're watching the volunteers do their bit. You make it easy for them. It feeds their soul. So it's, it's been an amazing journey, I've got to say. Okay, so, so the learning that I've, I've, the wisdom that I've accumulated serving the homeless people is I've come to realize the complexity of homelessness. Um, you know, I at times used to think, oh, these guys must get off the street, they must stop being lazy, um, they must go and get a job. It really isn't that simple. Um, I went homeless for 48 hours. 
um, as a challenge to raise money for the organization. Uh, I ended up being on the street for 54 hours in total. And the, the thing that got me the most about that was how quickly I slipped into survival mode. So if you think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you so quickly slip to tier one, where it's about survival. Um, how do you keep warm? Where do you wash? Where do you eat? You can't think of the future, you're thinking of the next hour. Then what I realized was how dirty you become and how quickly you become dirty. And for me it was easy because I was only on the street for 48 hours, so I had the clothes on my back. What happens after 48, literally after 48 hours, I was smelling. Okay, my clothes were dirty, they were smelly. Now, what do you do? with that you know how do I walk around with a fresh set of clothes um, I can't put them anywhere because they're going to get stolen they will most likely get stolen off me anyway so where do you put your clothes so so your self-esteem starts dropping um, so you can't you're not thinking of where can I get a job I mean I got a job I started off at um, Stratwerk an organization here in town the homeless people arrive they sit down and there's a whole tier it's a very fair system that they've worked out and depending where you are on the, on the tier you, you build up as you work and then you drop and then you build up as you work and you drop so depending where you are you go you arrive if you're on the tier one you will get you guaranteed a four-hour shift you don't work for them you literally you you um you you do what they ask you to do, and if you do it properly, they pay you. It's that simple. And I was given the job of going to clean the hotspots. And the hotspots is where the homeless, um, where you've got to clean their feces and their urine. So you go around, you're walking around the city within the precinct, the CCID precinct, and you go and find the hotspots where the guys are known to pee and shit. Yeah. And you've got to go and clean it. And that was a very powerful experience for me because, you know, I am walking around in the gear that they give you and I'm just watching people in the street and everyone's getting on with their life, not knowing about this. We don't know about this. And here are these guys that are walking around cleaning, keeping the city clean. It's a minor detail, but it's a big detail because if you leave it after a while, it's going to become terrible. And people are unaware of this. They're getting on with their life. They've got their own worries. You know, and I'm watching people in the shops and they're buying their food and... And I know because I do that. And here I am cleaning people's pee and shit. So that was a very powerful experience. And then you get 50 bucks for the four hours that you've done. And I had to make that 50 bucks last me that whole challenge. So I had to get accommodation, I had to get food, um, whatever I needed to survive those 48 hours. So where am I thinking about get off the street, get off where, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to get my next meal. Okay, so, so there's that. Then you've got, you've got people that have been kicked out of their families, or people that run away from their families because of abuse. Maybe they're gay and the family don't accept them. So they are chucked out into the street. You've got drug addicts. Drug addiction is a major problem. And, uh, I, you know, at the end of the day, yes, we have the choice to let go of that drug addiction, but it's not that easy. So you've got to deal with this drug addiction. And you've got people that don't have money that are homeless. Now, what do you want them to do? Where do you want them to go? Uh, alcohol, you know, alcoholics. They're lonely. They, they've got this alcohol problem, you know. And, um, you know, I was, I was told by a guy who, who tries to rehabilitate addicts or heroin addicts, he says alcoholism is as bad as heroin addiction. And heroin addiction is crazy. So now you've got all these homeless people. There's no support. They don't know how to change. It's like me saying to you, go and live on the street now. You're going to look at me like I'm crazy. So, you know, I can't go to a homeless guy and say, get off the street. You look at me like I'm crazy. And then on top of that, I mean, I did employ a homeless guy and I was paying him a stipend. What is he going to do with that stipend? Where is he going to get accommodation? 
how does it get him off the street? So it'll help him with a bit of food, so he doesn't need to dig in the bins. He's still going to have to find a place to sleep. And I know him, he was living in the mountains. And even in the mountains, he was constantly getting attacks, his tent stolen. Uh, so he was telling me, you know. So, and he still had a very much a homeless mentality. Even though, and I, I constantly had to say, and he'd come to work dirty, and I said, but you're getting some money, go and clean your clothes. There's a self-sabotage mentality. So they will sabotage because they don't, that's what they know. So it's a very complex situation. And for me, what I've come to realize about homelessness is that, is that it is a part of society. Whether you want to accept it or not, it's a part of society. So it's like if you have a saw on your arm and you ignore that saw, that saw could probably take out your entire arm if you don't look after it and take care of it. It's the same with homelessness. If we don't take care of it, it will become worse within society. People ask me, do I enable, don't they think I enable homeless people by feeding them? I enable them to stay on the street. And, and my answer is no. If I don't feed them, they're not going to get off the street. They're just going to become more desperate. With more desperation, turns, they turn to more crime, more aggressive begging, more bin digging. So for me, imagine we had to stop all the soup kitchens or all the feeding that people do. What would happen to that homeless community? Where would they go? So you can imagine the chaos if we had to. So for, so for me, the way I look at homelessness, I won't give money. I, there is a limit. I, I've become quite strict. Like guys will come to me in the kitchens. I am focused about feeding homeless. I, I, I will not give you money. Um, I, I'm not a, a, an addiction expert, so I can't get you off. I can hopefully guide you to a place where you can go. So, so my limit is food. I would, however, like to, and I've, I've started working with government, you know, I've started talking to council and stuff, and, you know, that we need to change our way of thinking. Uh, if I could create hubs within the city where the homeless can go and lock a clean pair of clothes, a clean set of clothes, or a place where they can leave their shoes or they can leave their ID, a place where they can go and shower every day, a place where they can wash their clothes, a place where they can maybe shave, you know, maybe provide them with some toiletries. My thought process, I don't know if it will work, but my thought process is if we can improve the dignity or the self-esteem, they will start thinking better. And if they start thinking better, maybe we'll have more and more getting off the street. I don't know. But it's a thought. So, for me, um, we cannot, we need to change our way of thinking about homelessness. It's part of society. It's going to stay. If anything, it's going to get worse. The way business is going, the way the population is growing, there's more and more poverty, there's more drug drug abuse, there's more alcoholism out there, it's going to get worse. So we need to we need to change our way of looking. We need to business if they want their city to stay nice and clean and in order, you need to put money into this. You know, into the homeless aspect. Let's create places where they can wash and clean and, and look after themselves so that they just become homeless people wandering on the streets. They don't bother anyone. Because let me tell you, I spoke to a lot of homeless guys. They don't want to beg. They don't want to beg. Yeah. They just, they know how to live on the street. And that's it. How do you change that? You know, if they're happy living on the street, that's their choice. I, what can I do? Yeah. Uh, so, so how do we make them so that, and yes, they are homeless. And, and it, I must tell you, driving and stopping at all the traffic lights and all the begging, it does. It gets... It becomes a lot, it becomes heavy, it becomes overwhelming. And uh, seeing the poverty in this country, it's, 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 it's very disturbing. But it's, it's, uh, we, we can't just put our heads in the sand and, and hope it's going to go away because that's not going to happen. It's never going to get better. Yeah. You, know, if, uh, you, you know, at least look after it, keep it, you know, so that it doesn't get worse. Yeah. You know? So, so how, do we, how do we make their life better so that they can live better? so that we can all live better. But retrenchments are happening because business is bad. <laughs> you know, people don't have money, so it's like a spiral. Like you said, you can't just go and start a business because a business time, I'm trying to start a business for ladles of love so that we don't need to rely solely on donations. So I want to start a business arm, and let me tell you, 
it's not easy. It's it's not easy, and it's 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 something that's going to take time. And I believe it will happen because my my focus for ladles is that a hundred percent of the donations go towards the cause yeah. that the business can support the admin costs. So I would okay. because a lot of organisations have to use a percentage of the donation to 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 keep the organisation going. And that's another big thing that I've learned about Ladles of Love and running a non-profit is that if you see it as a charity, it will remain a charity. You have to run a non-profit as a business. If you want to sustain it and you want to expand it so that you can help more people, you need to think like a business. You cannot think like a charity because you won't last. You, you, or you're lost, but you'll just you'll help the few around you. Which is not a bad thing. I'm not saying, but if, and nowadays there's more and more people that need help. So we need to, so we need to get more people involved, you know. And, and so we need to grow. As much as I don't like to use that word in a non-profit, but you have to grow. So, so you have to think like a business, and you have to make a profit. You know, the profit remains within the organisation, but you have to make a profit because if you don't, you cannot sustain it. And that's what I've learned so much. And then as you grow, you need to start employing people. Because now you need people to help you run this organization. I mean, I've seen it. I, I, I'm looking where we're going. And I mean, I've been blessed with volunteers that have literally helped me take ladles to where it is today. I mean, our website, our social media, Instagram, it's, that's been what's grown our organization, you know. But you need to... It's now getting to a point where I either, I mean, volunteers also, and they come and go, volunteers, you know? So you need to employ people, and you want to employ good people, you've got to pay a salary. It's like now I've got to pay a rent for, for this kitchen, you know? Thank God it's been, been sponsored, but now I've got new costs. I've got gas I need to pay, electricity I need to pay, more wages I'm going to need to pay. So my expenses are going up now. As much as I'm getting this kitchen, which is awesome, my expenses are going up. Where do I get that money from? You know? So now I have, to, I have to dig deeper into my donations. So, so while there, there probably are organizations out there that abuse how much of the donation they use for the cause and how much they use, they abuse their admin costs. But, I mean, I look at us now. I mean, my admin costs to run Ladles of Love, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm closing in on 50, 60, 70,000 rand a month. Yeah, and that's just to, okay, that includes the food, and, but I'm talking, that's what I need. So if someone donates 20 grand, I'm, and, and I'm stuffed. And let me tell you, January, February, for example, we had terrible months with donations. Literally, I think January we made we got like 20 grand, and February was where do I get the other 50, 60 grand? Luckily, I built up a reserve, and I, was, I had to dig into the reserve to keep it going. So, these are all the lessons. Yeah. yeah, so you need to think like a business, you have to, but I think you need to be transparent as well. It's yeah. very important that you're transparent, that you. And that's why for us, social media, and, and we don't, I mean, I don't know if you've seen our Facebook page and our Instagram, we're taking selfies, we're showing what we're doing, and we're not doing it to get the, oh, well done, Danny, that's so awesome, pat on the back. We're not doing it for that, we're doing it to show people that we are doing it. And that if you give us money, we're going to use it for the purpose of feeding or whatever. So, so and, and touch wood, I mean, people have, we've, People, we often get calls. We've heard so much about your organization and we want to get involved and our kid needs to do community work and we've heard about your organization. So, so I'm blessed and, and I will be very strict about that, about being transparent, about being real, that our purpose is to feed people. But we need to make a profit as well, you know. So if we tell you it's 10 rand for a bowl of soup, that 10 rand includes admin costs. You know, it probably only cost me two or three rand to make a bowl of soup, but got rent, I've got petrol, I've got this, that, wages. Who's going to pay for that? <laughs> I can't. <laughs> you know? So, so, yeah. So that's very important. Um, very important about being a non-profit. 
Well, I'm going to be honest with you. It, it takes a lot of commitment and a lot of discipline. Um, and you've got to want to do it. You've got to... Um, I don't... People say, what drives you? I, I don't know. I think it's... I think it's watching volunteers work together. I think it's, it's all the, the homeless thanking you. Um, uh, you know, watching people... Watching people come and help you, corporates coming to help you, um, but it does require commitment and a lot of discipline. And um, how? That that is my challenge right now. Is that I'm trying to run a restaurant, and I'm ladles of love just continues to burst at the seams. And people are phoning me. Can you help? Can you do? Can you do? So, so I'm getting to a stage where it's becoming really challenging to to run both but again I've been blessed with volunteers that we've, like Ladles has created this we have this course team of volunteers that I've become reliant on that have really been with Ladles for the last couple of years and, and I mean uh, so they're on the phone fundraising or we'll go and pick up or can we drop the soup for you or I'll go and do the soup kitchen for you so but it is about you, you need to plan your time you, you need to uh, you need to get into a routine unfortunately and, and you have to stick to that routine um, that's what I find works for me and and during the day when it's time for work if I've got nothing to do I find something because there is something I need to do yeah. you know so I won't I I, I I, I don't generally stop. Um, so, so it is. It, it takes a lot of commitment and a lot of discipline. And yeah, and you, for me, yeah, it's just I plan. I, I wake up in the morning. So okay, I've got to do this, this, this. Like I said, I've got my routine. I know when I'm delivering to the schools. I know when when suppliers are coming or other organisations are coming to pick up. I know I've got my ordering in place. So. So once you've got that, you stick to it and, and stick to it properly, you know. So it, it, it does. It takes time and it takes commitment. For me, Mandela is a man who he, he doesn't see himself as a black man. He sees himself as a human being. And he operates out of that beingness, if you know what I mean. He, he, he doesn't judge he doesn't care what color you are. He, he was a very fair man, I felt. Um, I mean, even when he came out of prison, um, he, he cared about the white people. He didn't want the white people to suffer, or like you've seen in other African countries. But whether we deserved it or not, you know, that's besides the point, and what they did to him, that he was able to come out of that and still say, you know what, this is a country for all. That is, that is leadership. That is leading with your heart, you know, and that's something you you don't learn. It's something we all born with it. We just got to know how to tap into it. We have it, and we've got to, we either lose it or <laughs> or we we yeah. So so for me he was he. I mean you can see for him it was about about leaving a legacy, you know. And I feel if, if, as human beings, we do that, how do, what legacy do we want to leave behind? Mm. And we live our life by how we want to leave our legacy. That will make you a great leader or a bad leader. You know? And let me tell you one thing I've learned about leadership. You can use it for the good and you can use it for the bad. Look at Hitler. Great leader. Yeah. But wow, look, look, look what he did. Mm. Mandela, great leader but he used his leadership for the good. So, so it, it just, for me, I, 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 yeah, I've never met the man, but watching and listening to speak, you read his quotes, that's a, man that come, that's, a, that's a man that comes from the essence of who we truly are, the human being of who we truly are. So I, I, I try, even with my guys here, you know, there's no such thing as black, white, I've told them. There's no such thing as male, female. We don't do that yet. 
we're a team here, and together we need to make this restaurant work. You know? And so, so yeah, that's what you, what I've learned from that man is you've got to you've got to come from within, and you've got to be a human being at all times. That's it. He's, he's almost a godly. He's like yeah. he's like a saint, probably. If you want to say that was, you know, he's probably like a Jesus Christ, maybe. You know, um, he was just in touch with his human being, and yeah. through his hardship. You know, I've come to learn that it's it's only through our hardship where we have a choice. We can feel sorry for ourselves, or we can take responsibility for it and say. This is a challenge, it's not a problem, it's a challenge. What do I need to learn out of it? And, you know, I've, I've come to realize that human beings, many times, the way they act, they don't know. They are acting as they know. So they might, they might think that, throwing, you know, accusing or, or swearing at you or whatever is, is a good thing because that's what they know. You know, you've hurt them, I'm going to hurt you back. You know, that's not what it's about. Buddha, Buddhism, you know, it's all about compassion, understanding, uh, knowing that we have an ego. Yeah. And the ego for me is like the darkness of our soul and, and, and our hearts is like the, the, the light of our soul. And, and we need to operate out of consciousness and not unconsciousness. You know? And I think Mandela was very much in touch with his conscious consciously with his soul and and he, like I said he remained a human being you still need to be tough you know you say no you still got to say no 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 but you know it's about having compassion and, and people people will walk over you and people will take advantage of you and it's about constantly forgiving for you not for them because you need that forgiveness so that you can continue. And um, so, yeah, you need it for you. And, and understanding that they don't know what they're doing. You know, I mean, I've had staff steal from me, staff that I wouldn't think. And, and you sit down in front of them and go, why did you do that? And, you know, and you're, not, you're not angry with them, you're more sad for them. Because you know that, you know, what they're doing. They might think they're stealing from this white man or from this business, but they're not. They're stealing from their soul. Because the more they steal, they'll just become, they'll just constantly be looking over their shoulder because they can't even trust themselves. So they will, you know, in time you can't trust anyone. And I truly believe if, if you're going to constantly take, life's going to take from you as well. And, and, and that's, you know, I hear the stories, the horrendous stories, and it's sad, you know. They constantly get in mugged or hijacked or stuff stolen from them, and and then you look at them, but and they'll look at any opportunity to take from you because they feel they deserve it, you know. So, so it's about having compassion and and breathing. <laughs> well, obviously, you know, with with corporates, I mean. We, we can't, uh, an organization like a guy like me who started, I wasn't born into a wealthy, a very rich family, so um, I was just lucky I had the restaurant, I had the kitchen, so I had the support of the business that I was able yeah. to start. So um, money is, is always a good thing. I mean, you know what I mean for, for organizations. Um, corporates are scared to give money at times because of there's the good and there's the bad, and unfortunately. And yeah. the bad make it hard for the good. Yeah. So, so, and then, and then it's, it's also quite tricky that I've noticed, you know, corporates like to work with organizations that are, um, um, what's the word, they, they are, they've been going for a few years, you know, um, that they have a bit of a reputation or they've got a, uh, they've got a track record. You know, but how do you get there? You know, it's like the chicken and the egg, which came first. So, and then you need to be a non-profit. Uh, you need to register it as a non-profit. So, so I think if corporates, if they can also turn to guys that are smaller and 
look at them and, and try and assist them, you know? Like, maybe, you know, keep it formal. We want to report. We want to know where the money's going, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the challenge with corporates is they need the MPO because they want the tax certificate. They're doing it for tax purposes and they're doing it for BEE purposes, which is, it's also sad, but, yeah, it just help, it, it makes it difficult for the small guys out there. Um, um, my journey has just been, I've been really blessed. That's it. Um, I was able to, to go from serving 70 meals to a non-profit, getting our own kitchen, and it's just been, just been blessed all the way. And now we're dealing more and more with corporates. They, they feel safer with me. We've got a non-profit. A lot of them just want to donate products. Like, you know, we don't donate money, but we'll give you 100 kilos of rice, you know. Like this ton of vegetables coming from one company. Man. Yeah, this is what you need. We're not going to give you the money to go and buy it, but we'll give you... We're a veg supplier, so hey, yeah, there's a ton of veg for you. So, so um, I think corporates need to try and try and assist smaller people so that you know we, we need to we, there's so much that there's so so many people and so much that needs help yeah. that the more people that are out there helping the better it will become because as you know for me it's also I'm very limited to how many people I can touch you know I'm touching because I work with another organization I'm, I'm supporting another school because I've got a corporate link to the school. they funding the feeding program. So, cool, we've got you a feeding program for a year. You're going to be, feed till, you're going to be fed till the end of the year. So, so we need, you know, we, we have to spread the help. We have to. Regarding starting your own, um, well, do something that you're passionate about. You know, like for example, if you're a dancer or a cameraman, go and find a community that you can help them learn to take pictures and how to take a picture. And, or if you're an artist, go and draw, find kids and after school, pull them off the street and let's paint together. Yeah. You know, um, I did food because yeah. that's what I know. You know, I grew up in a home where, in, in, in a Mediterranean home, where food was the center of your home. You know, you sat around a table and you ate. And you spoke and you ate and you drank and you laughed and you ate some more. And that's what I understood. So that's why it was easy for me. So, so do, if you're going to start something, do something that you, you're good at, that you're passionate about. And you know what? People have this thing that they've got to help hundreds of people. They like say, what is, what is the point? What is the point? I'm just going to help two people you know there's this I don't know if you've heard the story about the star beautiful story and I constantly reflect back on that because at times I feel it uh, there was an old an elderly man walking along the beach and he came over at June and he, he saw thousands of starfish stranded on the beach and he saw a young little kid picking up the starfish and throwing them back into the sea so he walked up to this kid and he says, why are you doing that? What's the purpose? And there's thousands of starfish. How are you going to help? So the young kid picked up one starfish, chucked it back into the sea and said, just help that one. And, and, and that's what it's about. I've had homeless people come to me and say, thank you, Danny. It's because you were at a soup kitchen. You were there for us to feed us every day that I was able to get a job. I have no idea how food and job, but they came to me and they saw that. And I was able, whether he still got the job or not, I don't know. But at that point in his life, Ladles of Love was able to help one guy. And that is a lot. Because if you help, I help, he helps, he helps, he helps, he helps, he helps. <coughs> if we all help, this world will be a lot better place. So, so don't look at, you know, focus. Start somewhere small. And just enjoy it. Just do it because it's sever, because you can. No other reason. And... And I remember the teacher saying to me, the more responsibility you take on, the bigger your shoulders become. And the more, the, the more life will work with you and give you what you need. And I tell you, I, that's what's happened with me and labels. So, you know, you start your organization, if your focus is to help 10 children out, that's fine. And if that's what you're happy to do, then do that. You know? So, it doesn't matter. But go out there and do what, what you're good at and commit to it, commit to it, and because you don't know where it's going to take you. 
because let me tell you, to register a nonprofit it took me almost two years. From the start till I became a PBO as a, as a non-tax, uh, where you're a non-taxpayer, took me almost two years and thousands of rands. Well, work with organizations that um, do what you're passionate about. Yeah. Learn something, work with them, you know, and see maybe, okay, cool, this is how they do it. Let me go and copy it, or in a smaller way, let me go and copy it. So, just do what you love and see if you can help someone with what you love and spend a bit of time. And you know what? It's like care cruises that I help. They do it once every two weeks. And that's how he's been doing it for the last two years. And he's cool with that. You know, he's happy. There's another old pasta kitchen. Her focus is to, they must come. It's like 70 or 80 people. They serve 70 or 80 people a plate of pasta, real Italian pasta in observatory. It's a small homeless community there. They go there. They, they do a bit of meditation. They do a bit of, uh, maybe a bit of yoga. A little bit, not just like five minutes, you know. And then they sit down around the table and they eat their dinner. They eat their plate of pasta every Wednesday, you know. And, it's where, and they've helped someone build a, a little home, a little shack. The, this guy got this piece of land from wherever, from the government, whatever. They, through their network, they got this shack built for him. They've helped that person, you know. And they've helped others. I've got uh, Gerald who's got Hope Street. And he comes and gets food. I forgot about him. He comes and gets food every Saturday. And he serves about 90 to 100 meals out in Greenpoint on Saturday morning. Before they start, they do a little prayer. All the volunteers will stand around together. They'll start. They'll, they'll do their... They'll, do, they'll like, talk about their week, what was good for you. They'll talk... They, they're quite religious there, so they'll talk godly stuff, which is perfect. They'll do their prayer, and then they'll start serving the homeless people. And they've had homeless people come and go, and they've had homeless people that have become part of their, their core volunteer team. You know? so, so that's what it's about. They do it, I do it. I'm just, I suppose, for, I, I, you know, I, I joined the Art of Living a few years back um, because a friend told me to, to go and do this course. It's a whole breathing and meditation, and it's really done wonders for me. But what I saw was how the founder... His goal, his journey is to touch as many people's lives as possible. So I give you the tool. There you go. What you do with it, that's up to you. But he has, your, he has the tool. Use it, don't use it, that's up to you. But, man, he touches thousands, millions of people's lives every year. And that for me was what I realized. Because through Doppio Zero, my biggest lesson I learned was that I cannot change anyone. You can only change you. And I've tried it, you know, I was trying to change the way my staff were thinking because I thought if, we could, if I change their way of thinking, the restaurant will run better. They're not in, they weren't interested. I brought in a black life coach, not interested. They were falling asleep. So I realized I can't keep focusing on these 50 people that are employed. It was becoming draining. They're not getting the message. They don't want to change. You've still got to stick to the rules and what we need to do. That's fine. But if you don't want to change, that's your story. So it's, for me, it's about planting the seed. So if I can touch as many people's lives with a bowl of fresh soup, that's what I'm going to do. Because, hey, you know, I've, I've seen how many homeless people it's touched. And, and their gratitude for this fresh, healthy bowl of soup that tastes good. And they come back for more, and thirds, because they're just, and they're shaking my hand. And I've had guys swear at me as well, you know, because I'm strict as well. You know, there's rules in our soup kitchens. But, yeah, it's, it's, for me, that's been my journey. That's why Ladles is probably where it is and where it's going to go. I don't know, you know. But, I mean, when I came back from that meditation course, the first time I remember, I said to my manager, I said, we're going to start a soup kitchen. I don't know why. We'll start cooking once a week. But I can tell you, we're going to be cooking five to six days a week. I just knew it. I just knew it. I didn't know how. I just knew that within a time period, we were going to be cooking more than one pot of soup. And so it happened. So, you know, if you want to... And, and sever is a very important part of life. It keeps us grounded. 
you know, it, it, it keeps us humble, brings us back to the essence of who we truly are. And we forget about what we don't have. And, um, and we appreciate what we have. And you know what, how our life is actually not so bad sometimes. And let's just have gratitude that we're helping this person. And they've proven, they've proven that when you help someone, it releases some chemical, I can't remember which one, it helps you feel better. So hey, do it. That's what I can say. <laughs>